At the beginning of the conflict in 1642, Wales had been a royalist stronghold. But throughout the war, one small part of the country held out for Parliament, South Pembrokeshire, and in particular, the town of Pembroke itself. What an irony it was that when rebellion against Parliament broke out in 1648, that the spark that lit the flame should have started, of all places, in Pembroke. And so serious did this uprising become that the London government sent its celebrated cavalry leader, Oliver Cromwell, to crush it. The background to the uprising was that after its military successes, Parliament wanted to disband many of its regiments. The problem here in Pembrokeshire was that its loyal soldiers hadn't been paid in a very long time, and it looked as though they weren't going to be paid in full anyway. So they were very angry. On top of that, some of their leaders during four years of fighting felt hard done by. They saw that royalists who had switched sides to support Parliament when they saw it was winning the war were now being rewarded with top jobs. That must have been very annoying. The governor of Pembroke at that time was Colonel John Poyer, who was also the town's mayor. And instead of being fated for his loyalty and fortitude during the conflict, he found himself accused of embezzlement. It's likely that Poyer was very angry, as angry for himself as he was for his unpaid men. He refused to disband his force. Two other parliamentarians in Pembrokeshire, Major General Roland Larne and Colonel Rice Powell, were also disgruntled with the way things were turning out. The government in London heard what was going on and sent a Colonel Fleming to replace Poyer as governor at Pembroke. But Poyer wasn't having it. He refused to go, and in mid-March, despite his years of fighting for Parliament, he declared his support for the King. He drove Fleming and his men out of the town. Underpaid Parliament troops and others with royalist sympathies heard about it and flocked to Pembroke to join the rebellion. Parliament sent a Colonel Reed and a force of 350 men to put down the uprising in Pembroke. The Colonel sailed from Bristol and landed at a small inlet called Pulkroch and very near Pembroke. He and his men decided to spend the night quartered around this church, St Mary's Church at Pulkrochen. And it's here the following morning that John Poyer and his men surprised them, overwhelmed them and disarmed Colonel Reed's men who were forced to march away in humiliation. The rebellion spread and other towns beyond Pembrokeshire were taken. Parliament ordered a tough new model army soldier to sort out the problem. He was a Colonel Horton, but he suffered initial setbacks in West Wales. Local people would not sell him supplies, bridges on his routes were destroyed, and he ran so low on ammunition during skirmishes that he had to retreat to Brecon. Fired up by success, the rebels under Major General Lawn and Colonel Rice Powell marched eastwards as far as Glamorgan. And then came that famous battle of St. Fagans. Colonel Horton marched south from Brecon with 3,000 very well-trained men and encountered the rebels led by Larne and Poyer. It was a very one-sided affair. The rebels were soundly defeated. There was great loss of life. Those survivors, demoralized, fled west, either just to go home or to seek refuge here at Pembroke Castle. Meanwhile, Parliament's commander-in-chief Sir Thomas Fairfax had sent Lieutenant General Oliver Cromwell with a strong force of five regiments, including cavalry, to make absolutely sure that the rebellion was put down. Cromwell passed through Cardiff, where he had an ancestor called Morgan Williams. In fact, Cromwell had, earlier in his life, signed documents as Oliver Cromwell alias Williams and Oliver Williams alias Cromwell. He arrived in South Pembrokeshire on the 24th of May, and he must quickly have seen that he had a very tough job ahead of him. He wrote that he was facing a very desperate enemy who, 
being put out of all hope of mercy and resolved to endure to the uttermost extremity. He also wrote that in the general population he was dealing with a seduced, ignorant people. In other words, he thought that simple folk had been misled into rebellion. Pembroke Castle was a strong and imposing fortress, surrounded by cliffs and the sea. The town itself had high defensive walls. Cromwell resolved to bombard the town and castle, while also trying to starve the rebels into submission. But the cannon he'd brought with him were too light and had little effect on stout medieval walls. He asked for powerful siege guns to be sent by sea. Bad weather delayed their arrival, so several times, perhaps impatiently, he attempted to take the town by storm, but each time was beaten back. It was said that the first time that the attackers tried to scale the town walls, they found out that their ladders were too short. What a disappointment that must have been. Another time, the town walls were breached and the attackers flooded into the town, but were beaten back in furious fighting. Many on both sides were killed. But the attacking wasn't all one way. The defenders launched a cavalry raid on the besieging troops, killing a number of them. The heavy artillery eventually arrived on the 1st of July. It was placed in a churchyard at nearby Moncton. This was now a very serious bombardment of the town and castle. Numerous people were killed. The situation inside the castle was absolutely desperate. Food had all but run out. The daily rations for the men were just a piece of beef and a little bit of bread. And the cavalry horses were fed on thatch from the roofs of houses. There's also a story that somehow the water supply within the castle was cut off, thereby hastening the end of the siege. Poyer tried to motivate his men by telling them that relief would come, either from a force from France led by Prince Charles, or from the Scottish army that had invaded northern England. But many men had already had quite enough. There were desertions and even talk of a mutiny. Cromwell sent a final demand for Poyer to surrender. In his letter he wrote, I must tell you that if this offer be refused, and thereby misery and ruin befall the poor soldiers and people with you, I know where to charge the blood you spill. I expect your answer within these two hours. Poyer knew he could hold out no more, and on the 11th of July he accepted terms and surrendered the town and the castle. It seems that the soldiers inside were allowed to go home, but Poyer and Lon were arrested along with Rice Powell who had been captured in Tenby, and the three of them were sent to London for trial. Found guilty, they were sentenced to death, but it was decided by Fairfax that only one of them should die. And then there was a strange and grim lottery. Three pieces of paper were put in a container, perhaps a hat. Two pieces bore the words, life given by God, and the third was blank. A child drew the lot for each man, and Poyer was given the blank. He was duly shot by a firing squad at Covent Garden in London. John Poyer was a crucially important figure in this saga. Various things have been said about his character in the years since, including that he was unruly and avaricious. It may be true, but perhaps it's worth remembering that this was a war in which propaganda really came into its own. As for Pembroke Castle, 
Cromwell had ordered that it be slighted, more or less destroyed so it could not be used again as a fortress, and much of it was dismantled or blown up with explosives. It remained a ruin for a very long time. What we see today is a building that was much restored in the 1920s. The rebellion at Pembroke Castle triggered the second of the civil wars between Parliament and the King in the 1640s. So it has an important place in Welsh and British history. And today, Pembroke Castle is a great place to visit in a lovely part of Wales. Music